In this week, we're going to discuss in detail our first supervised machine learning method, namely linear regression. While the first week had a strong focus on probability theory, of which uh, proper understanding is essential in order to be able to, to deal with uncertainties, uh, but it also gave us a way to formalize uh, when we think a system is optimal or when it is most probable. Uh, we worked in a relatively abstract setting without going into full details of how these models were precisely parameterized, but in this week we will, we will make things more explicit and explain how to construct and actually compute with linear regression models. Now in the first two lectures, three principles for probabilistic learning were discussed. We defined optimality criteria for when we consider a probabilistic model to be appropriate. It was either the model that gave the most likely explanation of the data, leading to the maximum likelihood principle, or, or we selected the model that was most probable given the data. This was the maximum a posteriori approach. Um, but we could also go fully Bayesian and define, define the, the predictive distributions to be the weighted average of all possible predictive distributions. Now, central in all cases was that we work with uh, predictive distributions of the following form. So we had some input x and we want to assign probabilities for all uh, possible target values well, given this input x. And we model this uh, via Gaussian distributions or normal distributions, which had the following form. So we had the normal distribution with respect to the random variable t, which was parameterized by some mean and some variance or some uh, inverse precision, right? And uh, where this, this mean actually derived from a modeling approach where we assume there's a, some clear relation between input x and target variable, uh, variable uh, t. But in the previous lectures, we sort of skipped over this part. Uh, so we sort of said, okay, we, there exists such a model and we're going to optimize it using these three principles uh, that I just uh, uh, mentioned, but we didn't uh, go into full details on how to obtain these uh, these actual models y of x parameterized uh, by w. And that's what we're going to do today. Now recall that regression is a machine learning task where we want to make predictions uh, given some input. So we're dealing with the data consists of input output pairs. And in the regression case, these outputs are a continuous uh, variable. So we want to predict some continuous value. So what we're going to do, we'll consider the input variables to be vectors in RD. So each input data point is a vector, is a d-dimensional vector. And now my output, I'm going to say that the corresponding output is just going to be some number. So I'm only considering scalar uh, target values uh, today. But this, of course, generalizes also to predicting multiple values at the same time. Okay, now let's think of a, a concrete example. Suppose my task is to predict house prices and I'm given uh, the floor area, I'm given the age or the building uh, year of the house, maybe how big is the garden. So all these uh, parameters can be stacked into one input uh, vector, right? So I have the measurements or variables on which I'm going to base my prediction and my prediction will be the house price, so just one number. Now the simplest linear model I can think of is just assigning weights to each of these uh, input uh, values. So that would be W0, that's a bias term, plus W1 times the first component, plus W2 times the second component, and so on. And I assign a weight to each of these uh, data elements. Now there's some ambiguity that needs to be resolved with respect to these indices. Uh, I noticed that I'm using indices here, an index xi that denotes the i data point. So uh, the i data point where each data point was a vector in RD, but now here the index refers to the co component within this vector. So let me just quickly clarify this. So here the index refers to component within the vector, within the d-dimensional vector, right? So uh, I denote a vector with uh, an underscore. So x underscore is an d-dimensional vector. 
and then without an underscore this is one component of such a vector so let's just write this out so i say that x is a vector um, that looks like this x1 x2 up to xd okay um, now actually sometimes it may be more convenient to work with this uh, vector form actually quite often it is so let's just write a simple linear model into this vector form then we have a set of weights which we can um, set to be w1 w2 wd okay let these be our weights and inputs uh, respectively then i can write this linear model i can write it as my bias plus my w transpose x now i can actually switch to full vector notation because now i still for, sometimes it's convenient to write this fully out as one uh, scalar product now i still have this bias term in here but i could include this bias term in my weight vector so let's do it let's add a zeroed component to this let's denote this with uh, w tilde for example uh, the same for x tilde but now i'm going to add a one and i'm going to do this because then i can write this linear model simply as w tilde transpose x tilde right because now we have w0 times 1 plus w1 times x1 w2 times x2 etc and i would then i would obtain my, my linear model okay so so sometimes we're going to use this extra prepended uh, bias so we include the bias in the set of, of weights and sometimes we, we treat it separately it should be clear from context um, otherwise we mention it but the main point is here we have a linear model and a linear model means that I'm just going to take linear combinations of my input vector where I assign one weight to each uh, vector component okay so let's make a drawing of, of what this uh, could look like uh, again let's talk about predicting house prices uh, let's say we have only one measurement uh, for example uh, the floor area so this is my input x and x is now just uh, some scalar value. And I'm going to predict the house price with it. House price. And now I have all these measurements. So I have this huge data point, database of data points, which I already see from this plot. I see that the house price increases with, um, well, with the flow area. And now I'm going to make a predictive distribution or a predictive function that describes this process that that maps each input parameter, so the floor area, to the corresponding house price. So I'm going to fit a model to it. Okay, so now uh, I'm considering linear models, so I can only take linear combinations of my input uh, variable with some bias term. So I have my weights, which looks like um, a weight zero and a weight one, and my input, let's say it consists of this constant one and um, x1 which was the floor area now suppose i would only fit um, the bias term so uh, that then maybe this is the best i can do this would be the case that my bias is fitted so it's unequal to zero but my linear component i'm going to set it uh, for zero for for the time being okay that's, so that's not not a good fit because it's just constant um, let's try a different model let's say we only uh, tune the the w1 parameter then maybe this is uh, the best i can do so let's fix my bias and let's tune my w1 uh, parameter so you see neither of the two is a good fit so of course we have to fit the full model to it which is going to be a combination of a linear component so the slope of this curve and a bias which enables uh, this uh, this offset over here and this this slope is determined by uh, w1 okay so with an appropriate set of uh, weights i can model this so i can come up with a model that maps each in input x uh, to a corresponding output given my my weights and of course this works well if we indeed have such a linear relation that uh, the prices nicely scale uh, with the floor area but suppose this isn't the case suppose my data looks something like this so again we have 
a floor area. And we have house prices. And my data points look like this. So like initially my house, pr house prices increase with square meter, but at some point it saturates. I don't know, maybe at some point people cannot afford uh, a house which is too big. So the house prices start to saturate. I think this sort of makes sense. But the point is now, of course, I can make a linear model fit. So I could maybe fit something over here, uh, but this would give me a very poor fit in this region. I could uh, maybe fit on this part, uh, on the saturated part, uh, but that obviously wouldn't describe well uh, this behavior over here. So actually to, to be able to act accurately describe this phenomenon, I'm going to need something better than just a linear model. So actually I want to model this thing over here. Now it turns out that we cannot describe such a model with just taking linear combinations of the input. But what we could do, we could first transform the input to a new set of values, to a new set of, let's say, measurements, and then define a linear model on this. And this would actually give me a way to come up still with linear models of x parameterized by a set of w's that describe this phenomenon. And we're going to do that via basis functions. And I hope I can make this clear in the upcoming uh, slides. So the approach is as follows. We still work with a fixed number of parameters. Let's denote this with capital M. So I have my weights, my weight factors, of my, or my weight factor is a vector of size M. Now I'm going to choose M minus one basis functions or features of X. So this means I have this phi of X and it returns a new feature. So what does this thing do? Each of these basis functions takes as input a d-dimensional, uh, my input vector and spits out a new feature value. And we'll see in a minute a bit more concretely uh, what this actually means, well, what these basis functions actually do. Uh, but now I have these basis functions and I have an index i that runs from um, 1 to m minus 1. Then my approximation is going to be as follows. So again, I have this uh, bias term over here, plus now I'm going to make linear combinations. Uh, so I'm going to assign a corresponding weight to each of these new feature uh, values that were obtained through by pulling these uh, inputs x through this basis uh, function. Okay, so here w0 is a bias. And now we're going to switch back to, to vector notation. So I'm going to define this thing over here. And this is going to be the connect, well, the, the concatenations of all these newly obtained feature uh, values. So I'll denote it as this. So this is going to be phi zero, phi one. So I'm really stacking all these new features on top of each other and minus one x this thing transpose, it's going, it is going to be a column vector. Now I defined this first basis function is always going to return the value one. And by doing so, uh, we saw that before, uh, by doing so we can incorporate the weights, uh, well, this bias inside the weight vector. And that will give me the following, uh, the following formula. So now my predictive model is still a linear model that looks like this, w transpose, and then the scalar product with uh, this newly obtained feature vector, right? So I'm always going to write underscore for uh, for vectors so, because I cannot write boldface. <laughs> That's the, the main reason. Okay, so if I write this out, uh, this thing corresponds to this thing over here, right? So I have w0 times one because my first basis function was always one and I have w1 times well, my first basis function, w2 times the second basis function, and so on. Okay, so we put this in, 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 in vector notation. Now, think again about what kind of objects we're dealing with here. So this thing over here, this phi um, underscore, so this vector uh, phi, it takes as input a data point, which was a d-dimensional uh, vector, and it turns this into an m-dimensional vector because each basis function took as input, so each fi took as input this d-dimensional vector and just spit out one new number. And if I stack them on top of each other, 
I will have m of these uh, new values. So I have a vector of size m. Okay, so this gives me a way to change the dimensionality of my data. So suppose I have only uh, a scalar, let's say floor area, I can turn this into m variations of floor area. Let's say floor area squared to the power three, uh, etc. So let's take a look at some options that we have for the corresponding basis functions. Let's say my basis functions are these projection operators, which takes as input the full vector x and projects it to one of its components. So the height basis function selects only the height uh, component. And in this case, the number of basis functions uh, equals the dimensionality of my, my vectors, right? For each component, I have one basis function. And then if I write this out, so this was my formula for my basis function uh, regression model. So I have uh, a bias term plus the sum over these basis functions, where I apply this weight to each individual basis function. Um, and yeah, so I'm just going to write out this basis function and that would give me W0 plus the sum I is one to M of W I X I. So we see uh, with such a projection uh, based basis function, I just re-obtain my linear regression model. So this doesn't really get us anywhere, but it will get us started on, on the idea of basis functions. Now let's consider the basis functions to be these power maps, these height power maps. So meaning that the height basis function takes x to the power i. Well, what, what would that give us? It would give us again this bias term plus w1 times x to the power one plus w2 times x to the power two plus w3 x to the power three, etc. So if we choose the basis functions to be these height power maps, um, I get a polynomial regression problem. And I again can formulate this into a vector notation, a w transpose scalar product with my uh, basis uh, vector where this vector was the collection of, of, of these values for the basis function. So phi of x is given by one x, x squared, x to the three, etc. Okay, so let's look at an example. So now my polynomial basis consists of these basis function. The, uh, the first basis function is just a constant. The second basis function is this uh, linear slope. The third will be this quadratic form and then the third, this one. And now uh, I'm going to define a model, I'm going to construct a model by assigning weights to each of these newly obtained feature vector. That would give us the function mapping on the right. So if I'm going to tune uh, the bias term, I will, will, will get an offset. If I'm going to tune the first component, I can add a slope. Uh, let's move it back. And then if I would tune the, the second weight, I would add this quadratic term to it. So we can make all these linear combinations of these basis function. So you see, now I'm actually constructing quite complicated functions just by taking linear combinations of uh, what I constructed with these basis functions. Okay, and this is still called linear regression because now I'm going to take linear uh, combinations of my uh, basis functions of these newly obtained feature vectors. Uh, with some w. So with respect to w, this problem is completely linear. But with respect to x, I now obtain a non-linear mapping from x to my output y. Uh, so this non-linearity is obtained via a clever choice of what my basis looks like. And in this case, I considered a polynomial basis. So now still this choice for basis function, that's a, cho that's a choice I have to make. It's, uh, we can consider it a hyperparameter. Now, I can make many choices and some choices are more suitable uh, for one problem and the others are more suitable for another problem. Um, I'm just going over some examples of basis functions that you encounter uh, quite often. And one of those is the Gaussian basis function, um, it, which consists of Gaussian functions, but without this correcting um, coefficient in front of it, because if I multiply this with the W, this correction factor or this front factor can be absorbed within W, so I'm not going to need that. Uh, so these basis functions look like this. It's these exponential, which have some offset, some mean. So this is a Gaussian blob, this exponential blob centered around some mean. 
and it has the shape determined by this co covariance matrix. Okay, so I'm considering d-dimensional input vectors and each basis function takes one of these input vector and spits out a new number, which can be thought of as proximity towards uh, to this, uh, these mean values. Uh, and these means are really hyperparameters that I pick myself. So I'm going to design a bunch of uh, basis functions that look like this. And then my linear model uh, with respect to W looks like this. So I have again my bias term plus a sum over all these basis functions. I assign a weight to each of these basis functions minus a half x minus mu i transpose inverse covariance matrix. Okay, and this looks something like this. Okay, so this is what the basis functions look like now. Again, I have this uh, bias term, so the constant one function, and then I have these shifted uh, uh, Gaussian blobs, and I'm considering the 1D case, right? So in each uh, Gaussian or each exponential is centered around some point. This one is centered around minus three over four. Uh, this one is centered around minus one over four and so on. So I have all these shifted basis functions. And now I'm going to make linear combinations of this. And that's, that allows me to, to construct functions that are more localized. So each basis function only considered a localized region. For example, in this region, I would say an increase with respect to my target value, followed by a decrease, uh, followed by an increase, and maybe an even uh, higher increase. Um, Again, so now I'm going to make linear combinations of my basis function. So it's still a linear regression problem, but uh, with respect to input variable x, the, the, the function y is highly nonlinear. Okay, so we see that each basis function has its own set of properties. The Gaussians are more localized, but we could also work with, for example, with logistic sigmoid functions. And whereas the Gaussians are really localized, the logistic sigmoid functions can be used to focus on regions like threshold regions. Uh, I'll, I'll give the example in a minute. But these logistic sigmoid functions, they look like this, one over one plus e to the power minus x. Let's consider the 1D case again. And then we can uh, shift these functions with a mu i parameter and we can scale them. Okay, so these logistic sigmoids look like this. Suppose I consider one of these basis functions. It has a particular um, offset point. So these are like smooth indicator functions where, which assign zero to a region below this threshold and one above this threshold. And there's this smooth transitioning going on which can be controlled with a steepness parameter. I can make this transition, uh, transition very smooth, but if I make S very small, then it becomes very steep. I make a very quick transition and then mu i determines the location of this transition. And you can imagine that these kind of basis functions are ideal for working with stepwise uh, functions. Or let's say um, my predicted label is only valid for some region. So let's say the house prices are, <laughs> uh, let, let's put some constant, my house prices are constant, but for some region, all of a sudden, if the square meter goes from, let's say, uh, 100 square meter to 500, I have a constant price. And after that, the houses become cheap again. So of course, uh, completely unrealistic, but <laughs> I couldn't come up with a better example just now. The point is, with these logistic sigmoid functions, we can, again, generate quite interesting functions simply by taking a linear combinations of these uh, basis functions. So it's a linear model, but the resulting predicted, predictive function is uh, highly nonlinear. Okay, so I showed several of these basis functions. Uh, and basically these are choices that you make in your model. I'm, uh, my choice is to work with a particular type of basis function. So we call, this is a choice, so we call it the hyperparameter uh, in some sense. And then each basis function in itself could also consist of several hyperparameters, like these offsets and these scales. So we call these things, we call them hyperparameters. Uh, same here, like this, this mu, the location of these uh, Gaussians and uh, their, their, their shapes or the covariance matrix are hyper parameters. And they're called so because they are not automatically set. Like the weights, um, so these weights, they are automatically obtained via some approach, via least squares regression or via uh, maximum a posteriori uh, optimization. But these things, we set them by hands typically. Uh, so that's why we call them hyperparameters.
Okay, so we've covered a bunch of uh, different types of basis functions. So we consider polynomials, which look like this. Each height basis function was basically x to the power i. Where in, in this illustration, x is really just one, a one-dimensional input. Uh, so that gives me a basis function for the linear slope, for a parabola, for third order, um, like x cubed. Uh, and so on. So this gives me a polynomial basis. Then we saw an example of a Gaussian basis functions, which looks like this. So each basis, each i basis function consists of a exponential one over two sigma squared. So that's the, the size or the scale of the Gaussian x minus mu i. And it was centered around some particular uh, centered around some particular mu i. And these basis functions have the property that they're highly localized. So that, that could be a very convenient uh, property uh, to work with. And, and then we had logistic sigmoid functions. So um, where sigma is defined to be the logistic sigmoid, so the smooth indicator function, and it could be scaled with some steepness uh, parameter. So mu i in this case determines uh, the offset, and then uh, s determines the slope of this uh, basis function. Now each class of basis function has its own properties and it's up to you as a designer of such, uh, such machine learning algorithms to, to pick the one that suits your problem best.